tonight, thousands of York University academic workers are expected to walk off the job tomorrow if no contract deal is reached tonight. Uh, it sucks because people are paying for an education that they're not even getting. So. More on the impact on students and what some of the sticking points are. Plus... Anything that people can save, it really helps. You may have a few more bucks in your pocket if you use the TTC Go and other local transit agencies. Come tomorrow, the TTC is joining the GTA's single fare system. And... Here's the 27-year-old Dalton Varsho. The latest on two of Toronto's teams. Spring training started this weekend for the Jays, and the Leafs celebrated their seventh straight win. This is CBC Late Night News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Thousands of contract academic workers at York University are planning to walk off the job tomorrow unless they reach a deal with the university in the next hour. The union representing the workers say many of its members can't afford to sustain a living with their current salary. Adam Khan has the story. The union representing 3,000 contract instructors, teaching assistants and graduate assistants at York University says their wages are too low and the cost of living too high. Our workers are really at a breaking point. Our Zoe Newman is part of QP's 3903's bargaining team, which has been asking for higher wages. Many of the members um, have to work two and three jobs. Many of our members rely on food banks just to survive. This all comes just over five years after a strike in 2018 at the York University. Back then, the Ford government passed legislation to end the months-long labour dispute. At the time, the province also passed Bill 124, which restricted wages to 1% a year for three years. That law has recently been declared unconstitutional. It's now off the books, but the union says its impact remains. We had our wages artificially and unconstitutionally um, held down by Bill 124, and we've all been affected by this, you know, inflation and cost of living. In a statement, York University says it hoped to achieve a negotiated collective agreement after offering a proposal on February 7th and February 21st. Thus far, none of these proposals have been responded to at the bargaining table, the school said. QP says the university is not serious about averting a strike after spending five hours at the bargaining table on Friday and not reaching a deal. Some students say they feel caught between the crossfire during midterms. It sucks because people are paying for an education that they're not even getting. I think it just screws all of us. Others, including the student union, are in favor of a strike. They're working conditions are ultimately going to be our learning conditions. So if they're not able to be able to work, um, that's going to have an impact on our education experience. You know, the cost of living is going up and whatnot. Their wages aren't going up. This expert says it's a tough negotiation. Clearly, uh, unions and employers, w employees want to obtain at least some uh, recognition of the fact that they have not had major salary increases and that inflation has been high. Uh, at the same time, you have a, a system which has not received increases in government funding um, and no increases in tuition and other sources of revenue. But some relief could be coming. A provincial funding announcement for Ontario colleges and universities is expected. A source told CBC Toronto it could be to the tune of $1.2 billion. If workers hit the picket line tomorrow, the university says students' learning needs remain the top priority. Adam Kahn, CBC News, Toronto. And if you take transit in the GTA, you might be finding yourself some savings. That's because a long-anticipated program is going into effect tomorrow. Patrick Swadden has those details. Transit riders are pumped. With the one fare program kicking in tomorrow, no more paying double when transferring between two GTA transit systems. It needs to be like that. Yeah. It'll make everything smooth, you know? Anything that people can save, it really helps. The plan, approved by the TTC board last year and announced by Olivia Chow and Doug Ford earlier this month, will get rid of double fare charges for riders transferring between the TTC and GO Transit or other GTA transit agencies, such as Brampton's transit system, Durham Region and York Region Transit, and MyWay in Mississauga. 
If you're switching between transit systems within a two hour window, say between my way and the TTC, just tap your card or your payment system, free transfer. If you're hopping on a GO train from the TTC, your TTC fare will actually be reimbursed when you tap your Presto card. Something many transit systems outside the TTC already had in place with GO. TTC riders happy now to be part of the one fare system, which Metrolink says could save an adult who commutes five days a week up to $1,600 per year. I go from Hamilton to Union basically every day almost, so it makes a difference. I often uh, travel to Oakville and Mississauga, so it definitely helps. This is going to make a big difference. This transit advocate lauds the move, but... We'd like to see the policy go even further and bring in a single flat fare in Toronto so that you could take the TTC, GO or Union Pearson Express all for the same fare. And Paisy Allen says monthly TTC pass holders might not reap any savings when transferring to and from the GO. What we're hoping is that this will encourage the TTC to look at bringing in fare capping, which means once you tap a certain number of times, you ride free for the rest of the month. Allowing riders advantage of the one fare discount and a monthly pass. The province is funding the program until early 2026, which is set to cost tens of millions of dollars per year, leaving some concerned about its longevity. We know that people hate losing a benefit. Councillor Diane Sachs says the TTC was blamed when previous attempts at integration were cancelled, prompting a motion of her own that says... If and when the province pulls the plug again, they will have to be clear to the public that this is entirely their doing. But Sachs and transit users say they're hopeful the program will be here to stay. Patrick Swadden, CBC News, Toronto. And tonight at midnight, Lynx Air will cease operations. The budget airline made the announcement last week, leaving some customers who had flights scheduled this week scrambling to book with other carriers or leaving them grounded. The biggest impact is just the cost of replacing those flights because obviously a lot of people booked Lynx Air because they were a discount carrier. They offered significantly lower prices than some of the mainline carriers we have in Canada. And now they're looking to rebook with March break, spring break just around the corner, Easter, and prices can sometimes be double and not everyone has that extra money to spend. So Lynx Air is advising impacted passengers with existing bookings to contact their credit card companies to request refunds. The Calgary-based airline launched less than two years ago. It's blaming rising operational costs, fuel prices and Canada's flight regulations as reasons for why it's shutting down. Turning to weather now, here's a live look uh, from Toronto CN Tower with an east-facing view. It's overcast, feels like uh, about five degrees right now. Let's bring in Ward Anderson. Ward, it was warm, then it was cold, now it's warming up again. How's this next week looking? Well, you know, Angelina, what we're going to see over the next several days is a little bit of what we've already been seeing, which is those fluctuating temperatures. It, of course, got cold over the past couple of days after we had several days of spring-like temperature. But the good news is tomorrow we will have spring-like temperature uh, for this time of year especially. It's going to feel more like April for the next few days across Ontario and in the GTA. Tomorrow, sunny day, about 7 degrees in the GTA, looking pretty good. But we do have this system coming through that is going to bring with it some rain on Tuesday. As we go mo Monday overnight into Tuesday and well into Wednesday, rain is coming through the area and along with with rising temperatures. We could be seeing up to 15 degrees on Tuesday and Wednesday in the GTA. And with that comes the risk of thunderstorms. Could be looking at that Tuesday and Wednesday. And then after that, we have a cold front coming through. We're going from 15 degrees in parts of the province to it suddenly dropping down. And then come Thursday, we're dropping back down to cold once again. Thanks for that, Ward. And tonight, many of us here at CBC News are remembering the humor and hard work, work of our colleague James Murray. Even here in Toronto, where snow on December 25th is never a sure thing, there's white all around, the ice looks great, and Christmas cheer is easy to find. As a reporter, writer, producer, or a host, James contributed to every major news program across Canada and overseas. 
With a keen eye and a fierce loyalty to public broadcasting, James covered wars, disasters, and politics. He died this weekend in Nova Scotia after a long struggle with cancer. Colleagues here are remembering him as incredibly friendly, funny, and unforgettable. To some international news now, the fighting in Ukraine is entering its third year, and today Ukraine's president said more military support is needed from allies within the month. Vladimir Zelensky said Russia is preparing an offensive, and a plan is in place to repel that. Russia will be prepared for the next attack. Zelensky expressed confidence the latest U.S. assistance package would pass Congress. There was also a stunning revelation that plans for last year's Ukrainian counteroffensive were leaked to the Kremlin. And today at the front, Ukrainian officials said Russian strikes damaged a railway station and some nearby apartments. Zelensky says he's pushing for a summit of allies to discuss Ukraine's proposals for a peace deal. Meanwhile, Canada's diplomatic presence is on display again today. A delegation of Canadian officials met in Poland earlier. The CBC's Evan Dyer looks at the worries around Ukraine's military stores. In a muddy field in Poland, Ukrainian troops are learning from Polish and Canadian instructors how to dress wounds, apply a tourniquet to stop bleeding, and medevac a casualty, all skills they may soon need on the front lines. The Russian military is targeting medical assets. Basically, the Ukrainians do not fly the Red Cross because it just makes them a high-value target. In a sign of some of the basic equipment that Ukrainian troops are lacking, Canadian trainers here have started donating first aid kits to them when they go back to the front and also want to give them this. This is a Canadian stretcher, kind of like a crazy carpet that allows one soldier to drag another across the ground. Often in the combat zone, Ukrainian soldiers are reduced to removing doors from abandoned buildings to use the stretchers. So the need is uh, the whole range of weapon and ammunition, starting with uh, armored vehicles and artillery shells, finishing with drones. NATO countries have promised to provide a million drones this year. But NATO admits an earlier promise to provide a million howitzer shells by March won't be met. Ukraine now wants long-term agreements to give it more predictability. The West is there for the long haul. And so Canada will give Ukraine $320 million worth of military assistance this year, as well as backstopping $2.4 billion in loans through the IMF. The EU has given 50 billion euros, but a 60 billion dollar package of aid and arms from the U.S. is being blocked by Republicans. What we see is that we need a plan B in case uh, the Congress in the United States doesn't come through, in case there's a President Trump that gets elected, um, and in case the Ukrainians uh, cannot hold the defensive lines. And for the soldiers here, that's a pressing concern. They know they'll be badly outnumbered at the front, and without more help, badly outgunned. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Warsaw. To the crisis in Gaza now, talks are continuing for a possible ceasefire to free hostages held by Hamas. And today the White House was sounding an optimistic note. It is true that the uh, representatives of Israel, the United States, Egypt and Qatar met in Paris and came to an understanding among the four of them about what the basic contours of a hostage deal for temporary ceasefire would look like. Still, Israel says whether there's a truce or not, it will eventually launch a ground offenses, offensive on Rafah, where more than half of Gaza's population is now congregated. And Hamas is still insisting on an immediate permanent ceasefire, which Israel rejects. Today, there were more military operations across Gaza, and gun battles were reported in Gaza City. Welcome back. Here's a sign that spring isn't too far away. The Toronto Blue Jays played their first exhibition game of the season in Florida yesterday. Here's the 27-year-old Dalton Varsho, who rips the ball to first. It's off the glove of Clemens and into right field. Bichette will score. Coming in home is Turner, and Dalton Varsho strides into second with a two-run double. Despite that hit by Dalton Varsho to open the scoring, Toronto lost 14-13 to Philadelphia. For more on how last year ended for the team and a look ahead to this season, we spoke with Toronto star baseball columnist and host of the Deep Left Field podcast, Mike Wilner. At the end of it all, the Blue Jays wound up winning 89 games last year, and the team that won the World Series won 90. So it, it just shows you how close those margins are and, and how um, the, the tiniest little... Uh, 
here and there can make a difference and just getting hot in the playoffs. And they were definitely terrible in the playoffs. They scored just the, the one run. Uh, but I expect them to be as good or better this year. And I, I know it, it seems odd because, you know, they don't have Matt Chapman anymore and, and they, they replaced Brandon Bell with Justin Turner and Bell was their best hitter. And, and they didn't they didn't make the significant changes it felt like they needed to make over the course of the offseason. But they are looking for a lot of internal improvements. And honestly, there are a lot of players who should be internally improving quite a bit, uh, such as Alec Manoa and Vladimir Guerrero and Dalton Varsho, who you showed off the top. All those players have way more in them. And if they can just be who they have been in their careers on an average basis, the Blue Jays are going to be a lot better this year. And the other boys in blue continued their winning ways last night against Colorado. And as you saw right there, Tyler Bertuzzi netting the hat trick in the 4-3 win on his birthday to add a little cherry on top. The win marked the seventh in a row for the Buds, and they will be looking to make it eight in a row against the Las Vegas Golden Knights on Tuesday. One expert we spoke to says the win over Colorado could be a sign for things to come for the Leafs. That win against Colorado, who's one of the best teams in the league, really proved that they can hang with the best. And in that game, they, like I said, it's it's the end of the road trip. It's where they're really tired and they didn't play their best, but they played a postseason type of hockey where you grind it out and players like Max, Max Domi and Tyler Bertuzzi are able to play that postseason game and they've gotten buy-in from the entire forward group. And I think that sets them up very nicely going into the postseason where they've traditionally struggled to get that depth attitude out of, out of their forward group and get those guys going. So if, if they're able to maintain that against a good team like Colorado, I don't see why they couldn't hang with anybody in a seven game series come April. Welcome back. A new space believed to be the first of its kind in Toronto is offering prenatal and postpartum midwifery care for black families. It comes as there's increasing urgency around the black maternal health crisis. Our Shannon Martin got a peek inside just before opening day. You were just perfect. You were made for the screen. At just three months old, little Noah is all smiles. He's been so good. Like I can't, I couldn't even, I couldn't complain. Soon this space in Scarborough will be filled with little ones just like him. As Ancestral Hands Midwives opens doors for prenatal and postpartum care. What I envision for this space is that when you walk in the door, you're met with uh, music. You are met with, you know, some snacks because everybody likes food. <laughs> and it just feels like a place, it feels like you're going to your auntie's house, right? And you're getting what you need from your cousins and your family and, and all of the folks involved in, in what makes you feel fantastic. A warm, welcoming, and safe space, all part of a longtime vision of founder Althea Jones. Simply because of race alone, when a black woman or person walks into their maternity care, they're at higher risk of death, of complications, of, of not being treated well, not getting the same course of care that others are offered. So it's a huge crisis. And that's where this latest passion project comes in, expanding access to clients who may have previously been excluded. So we know that the black population has a higher incidence of chronic illnesses and an earlier onset. So because of that, because midwives typically deal with low risk, normal birth, a lot of people are actually disqualified from the free care, which it's a big issue. Um, when you see that there's health disparities going on, I think midwifery is part of the solution. So we're trying to change that access. So being able to um, have high-risk clients, which midwives aren't usually um, a part of their care, um, is fantastic because we can give all the benefits of midwifery care. So the longer appointments, informed choice, really make sure that we explain options and the client's able to make that final decision and pair that with an OB who's able to do the high-risk stuff. And Toronto Jewish community group Vea Hofta held its fourth annual coldest night of the year event last night. 
The reason we do this is really to recognize that there are people right here in our own community who are spending the winter and the summer and the spring and the fall unhoused outdoors. And when we experience the cold and the dark ourselves together doing this walk, it really raises our, our level of empathy to stop and really give some thought to like, what is it like to survive on the streets of Toronto in this kind of weather? Participants went on two or five kilometer walks in the frigid temperatures, all to raise funds and awareness for homelessness in Toronto. The group has raised $128,000 over the last three years, with 350 walkers taking part in that time frame. Let's take a live look at Ottawa tonight, where it feels like it's around minus one. There's a little bit of light snow in the forecast, but as Ward was telling us earlier, we can expect a bit of a warm-up later this week. Let's bring him back in now for a look at your long-range forecast. Ward, what have you got for us? Well, it seems like we've gone from winter to spring to winter to spring, and that's going to continue a little bit this week. It's going to feel like April, the last week of February. So. Last week, of course, we had warmer temperatures across the province, and then it dropped over the weekend, like we've seen. Well, we've got another day of that, but at least it's going to be a sunny day, and that's how we're looking tomorrow across the province. Uh, a little warmer than usual, but still just a little bit. Quite chilly, I think. Five degrees in our nation's capital, maybe 11 degrees over in Windsor. But then as we go into Tuesday, we have this system coming through that's going to bring with it a good bit of rain over the following two days, Tuesday and Wednesday. Monday overnight through Tuesday and Wednesday, that rain coming through. But with it is coming higher temperatures. Look at Tuesday in Niagara Falls, plus 15 degrees, plus 15 in Ottawa. It's going to suddenly go up to April-like weather with April-like showers. But as that continues, we always have that risk when the temperature goes up and the rain comes through of thunderstorms. A lot of thunderstorm energy coming through the province, especially the more we go over to the southwest side. However, it will continue to stay warm. We'll have the rain Tuesday and Wednesday. But then look at this. As we go into Thursday, that temperature is dropping again well below zero. And we're going to be feeling like winter as we go into the rest of the week. Thank you for that, Ward. Well, that's our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. But before we go, let's head back to Ottawa, where it was the last day for skating on the iconic Rideau Canal. Due to warmer weather, it was only able to open for a grand total of 10 days this season, making it the shortest ever, if you don't count last year when the rink never opened at all. We'll leave you with some images of people enjoying the ice this weekend. Thank you so much for watching, and have a great night.